Reading Rhinos presents Percy Jackson and the Olympians, number one, The Lightning Thief, by Rick Riordan. Chapter two, three old ladies knit the socks of death. I was used to the occasional weird experience, but usually they were over quickly. This 24-7 hallucination was more than I could handle. For the rest of the school year, the entire campus seemed to be playing some kind of trick on me. The students act as acted as if they were completely and totally convinced that Mrs. Kerr, a perky blonde woman who I've never seen in my life until she got on our bus at the end of the field trip, had been our pre-algebra teacher since Christmas. Every so often I would spring a Mrs. Dodds reference on somebody, just to see if I could trip them up, but they would stare at me like I was psycho. It got so I almost believed them. Mrs. Dodds had never existed. Almost. But Grover couldn't fool me. When I mentioned the name Dodds to him, he would hesitate, then claim she didn't exist. But I knew he was lying. Something was going on. Something had happened at the museum. I didn't have much time to think about it during the days, but at night, visions of Mrs. Dodds with talons and leathery wings would wake me up in a cold sweat. The freak weather continued, which didn't help my mood. One night, a thunderstorm blew out the windows in my dorm room. A few days later, the biggest tornado ever spotted in the Hudson Valley touched down only 50 miles from Yancey Academy. One of the current events we studied in social studies class was the unusual number of small planes that had gone down in a sudden squalls in the Atlantic that year. I started feeling cranky and irritable most of the time. My grades slipped from D's to F's. I got into more fights with Nancy Bobblefit and her friends. I was sent out into the hallway in almost every class. Finally, when our English teacher, Mr. Mr. Nicole asked me for the millionth time why I was too lazy to study for spelling tests, I snapped. I called him an old sot. I wasn't even sure what it meant, but it sounded good. The headmaster sent my mom a letter the following week, making it official. I would not be invited back next year to Yancey Academy. Fine, I told myself. Just fine. I was homesick. I wanted to be with my mom in our little apartment on the Upper East Side even if I had to go to public school and put up with my obnoxious stepfather and his stupid poker parties. And yet, there were things that I'd, things I'd miss at Yancey. The view of the woods out of my dorm room, the Hudson River in the distance, the smell of pine trees. I'd miss Grover, who'd been a good friend, even if he was a little strange. I worried, I worried how he'd survive next year without me. I'd miss Latin class too. Mr. Brunner's crazy tournament days and his faith that I could do well. As exam week got closer, Latin was the only test I studied for. I hadn't forgotten what Mr. Brunner had told me about this subject being life and death for me. I wasn't sure why, but I started to believe him. The evening before my final, I got so frustrated I threw the Cambridge Guide to Greek Mythology across my dorm room. Words had started swimming off the page, circling my head and the letters doing 180s as if they were riding skateboards. There was no way I was going to remember the difference between Chiron and Charon, or poly, polydicts and polyduces. And conjugating those Latin verbs? Oh, forget it! I paced the room, feeling like ants were calling, crawling around inside my shirt. I remembered Mr. Brenner's serious expression, his thousand-year-old eyes. I will accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I took a deep breath. I picked up the mythology book. I'd never asked a teacher for help before. Maybe if I talked to Mr. Brunner, he could give me some pointers. At least I could apologize for the big fat F I was about to score on his exam. I didn't want to leave Yancey Academy, Academy with him thinking I hadn't tried. I walked downstairs to the faculty offices. Most of them were dark and empty, but Mr. Brunner's door was ajar. Light from his window stretching across the hallway floor. I was three steps from the door handle when I heard voices inside the office. Mr. Brunner asked a question. A voice that was definitely Grover said, Worried about Percy, sir. I froze. I'm not usually an eavesdropper, but I dare you to try not listening if you hear your best friend talking about you to an adult. I inched closer. Alone this summer, Grover was saying. I mean, a kindly one. In the school? Now that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make matters worse by rushing him, Mr. Brenner said. We need the boy to mature more. But he may have, he may not have time. The summer solstice deadline will have to be resolved without him, Grover. 
Let him enjoy his ignorance while he still can. Sir, he saw her. His imagination, Mr. Brunner insisted. The mist over the students and staff will be enough to convince him of that. Sir, I... I can't fail in my duties again, Grover's voice was choked with emotion. You know what that would mean. You haven't failed, Grover, Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now let's just worry about keeping Percy alive until next fall. The mythology book dropped out of my hands and hit the floor with a thud. Mr. Brunner went silent. My heart hammering. I picked up the book and backed down the hall. Shadows slid across the lighted glass of Brunner's office door. The shadow of something much taller than my wheelchair-bound teacher, holding something that looked suspiciously like an archer's bow. I opened the nearest door and slipped inside. A few seconds later, I heard a slow clop, 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 like muffled wood blocks, then a sound like an animal snuffling right outside my door, a large, dark-shaped pause in front of the glass, then moved on. A bead of sweat trickled down my neck. Somewhere in the hallway, Mr. Brunner spoke. Nothing, he murmured. My nerves haven't been right since the winter solstice. Mine neither, Grover said. But I could have sworn. Go back to the dorm, Mr. Brenner told him. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow. Don't remind me. The lights went out in Mr. Brenner's office. I waited in the dark for what seemed like forever. Finally, I slipped out into the hallway and made my way back up to, to the dorm. Grover was lying on his bed, studying his Latin exam notes like he'd been there all night. Hey, he said, bleary-eyed. You going to be ready for this test? I didn't answer. You look awful, he frowned. Is everything okay? Just tired. I turned so he couldn't read my expression and started getting ready for bed. I didn't understand what I'd heard downstairs. I wanted to believe I'd imagined the whole thing. But one thing was clear. Grover and Mr. Brunner were talking about me behind my back. They thought I was in some kind of danger. The next afternoon, as I was leaving the three-hour Latin exam, my eyes swimming with all Greek and Roman names I'd misspelled, Mr. Brunner called me back inside. For a moment, I was worried he'd found out about my eavesdropping the night before, but that didn't seem to be the problem. Percy, he said, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey. It's... It's for the best. His tone was kind, but the words still embarrassed me. Even though he was speaking quietly, the other kids finishing the test could hear. Nancy Bowafit smirked at me and made sarcastic little kissing motions with her lips. I mumbled, okay, sir. I mean, Mr. Brunner wheeled his chair back and forth like he wasn't sure what to say. This isn't the right place for you. It was only a matter of time. My eyes stung. Here was my favorite teacher in front of the class telling me I couldn't handle it. After saying he believed in me all year, now he was telling me I was destined to get kicked out. Right, I said, trembling. No, no, Mr. Brunner said. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say is, you're not normal, Percy. That's nothing to be... Thanks, I blurted. Thanks a lot, sir, for reminding me. Percy. But I was already gone. On the last day of the term, I shoved my clothes into my suitcase. The other guys were joking around, talking about their vacation plans. One of them was going on a hiking trip to Switzerland. Another was cruising the Caribbean for a month. They were ju juvenile delinquents like me, but they were rich juvenile delinquents. Their daddies were executives or ambassadors or celebrities. I was a nobody from a family of nobodies. They asked me what I'd be doing this summer, and I told them I was going back to the city. What I didn't tell them was that I'd had to get a summer job, walking dogs or selling magazine subscriptions, and spend my free time worrying about where I'd go to school in the fall. Oh, one of the guys said. That's cool. They went back to their conversation as if I'd never existed. The only person I dreaded saying goodbye to was Grover, but as it turned out, I didn't have to. He'd booked a ticket to Manhattan on the same Greyhound as I had. So there we were together again, heading into the city. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. It occurred to me that he'd always acted nervous and fidgety when we left Yancey, as if he expected something bad to happen. Before, I'd always assumed he was worried about getting teased, but there was nobody to tease him on the Greyhound. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, looking for kindly ones? 
Grover nearly jumped out of his seat. Wh wh what do you mean? I confessed about eavesdropping on him and Mr. Brunner the night before the exam. Grover's eye twitched. How much did you hear? Oh, not much. What's the summer solstice deadline? He winced. Look, Percy, I was just worried for you, see? I mean, hallucinating about demon math teachers? Grover. And I was telling Mr. Brenner that maybe you were overstressed or something, because there's no such person as Mrs. Dodds, and... Grover, you're a really, really bad liar. His ears turned pink. From his shirt pocket, he fished out a grubby business card. Just take this, okay? In case you need me this summer. The card was in fancy script, which was murder on my dyslexic eyes. But I finally made out something like, Grover Underwood, Keeper, Half-Blood Hill, Long Island, New York, 800-009-0009. What's half? Don't say it out loud, he yelped. That's my, um, summer address. My heart sank. Grover had a summer home? I'd never considered that his family might be as rich as the others at Yancey. Okay, I said glumly. So, like, if I want to come visit your mansion, he nodded. Or, uh, or if you need me. Why would I need you? It came out harsher than I meant it to. Grover blushed right down to his Adam's apple. Look, Percy, the truth is, I, I kind of have to protect you.